What is going on, Cheats Kingdom? Welcome back to another episode of The Kingdom Says. I am your host, as always, Garrett Williams, and I am joined today by a whole cast of characters. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see the many faces on the screen. I've got my two usual co-hosts with me, Kyle Henning and Arrowhead Tom. Boys, how we doing tonight? Uh, opening night of Super Bowl week, so... Sure is. Enjoying whatever this coverage is that we are kind of getting from the TV networks that are covering the media day at Super Bowl week. Um, kind of following along on Twitter, along with several other ways. But other than that, good. Re- kind of ready for the game to get here, but excited to talk to everybody this evening. So got a, got a first-time guest on this show on tonight. So Yeah. Yeah. Tom, how we doing? We're doing good. Hey, did you guys know that the Kingdom Says podcast is the number one Chiefs podcast as long as we get the listens. Okay. That's, that's fair. I believe it. I believe a, it. A first taste, yeah. That's a reference to you guys looked at me like I was crazy. It, it, I thought it was funny. I got it. We'll move on. Yeah. Okay. Must have, must have it missed works that. 100% of the time, 60% of the time. Uh, yeah, correct. Of the time. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and then at the bottom left of the screen, we've got uh, Kingdom Cast film analyst DMAC Wake 316. DMAC, how are we doing tonight? I'm doing good, man. Uh, I, I was I woke up this morning and I was like, you know what? The Chiefs are in another Super Bowl. And, you know, for most of my lifetime, saying those words would be kind of crazy. And now it yeah. feels very normal and it's awesome. <laughs> Enjoy it, it is pretty it's pretty surreal to think about that. Many people, including myself, definitely, uh, you know, has always a thing. Like, hopefully they win one or at least go to one in our lifetime. You know, that'd be crazy. And then uh, all of a sudden, it's the the fourth one in five years we're going to. It's it's pretty surreal, um, but it's a new standard that's been set in Kansas City. Obviously, this uh, this past six years of the Patrick Mahomes era, um, and it's it's been a good ride. And uh, we've got yet another Super Bowl week here. Um, Super Bowl media night just kicked off tonight as uh, the the teams landed in Vegas yesterday, and uh, here it goes. You know, we've got practices going on um some teams are a little unhappy with their practice hi scout uh <laughs> yeah, scout one of the yeah i'm trying to yeah, <laughs> does from time to time. yeah but there's already been uh, some talk um i think we'd mentioned last episode some of the 49ers uh talk that they've been they've been saying already early and then uh you know we've had some reports uh, today and the, yesterday that their field their practice field isn't isn't very nice oh no <laughs> what are we what are we gonna it, do about that? Okay, Notorious so field sabotage, Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> yeah, it's apparently too soft for them, yet well within everything from the NFL's safety standard. Like, what are we what a posh have we ever seen a team make soft. this many excuses before the game has started, D Mac? Like, what are we doing here exactly? No, I don't think I've heard uh we've gotten uh ownership. Uh, groups uh, complaining about holdings. We've got players complaining about holdings, and now we have practice field. Um, and I'm enjoying the holdings uh, four seeing... years ago, by the way. The ownership group yeah, complaining for about a holding from <laughs> four years ago. Yeah, so that really wasn't actually incredible. Holding. No, I, I wanted I wanted so badly for anybody in the room to be so. Jed York, um, so can you get a holding call when a pass rush does a rip move? And he'd be like, "What is a rip move? What's what <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is a rip? I, Literally, that's." Yeah. Well, I don't we think some of the defensive ends know that what that's called because they apparently be not because they complain about it a lot when they clearly are, like the yeah. Adafi Owe picture mm-hmm. that he yeah. posted. He's doing it's, a rip move. Doing a rip move. <laughs> like, and, and, look, it's, it's a pretty technical rule, but still, like it's your job. You should probably yeah. know so that if you should rip probably move, know you're that. Yeah. Call yeah. on it. <laughs> that's one of the ones that's written explicitly. If you do Literally this, said, not yeah. a penalty. It, it, yeah. And it's so specific to like because the NFL rule book is generally you know kind of black and white things that happen during an NFL game, but that's literally such a, a specific yeah, rule. Very, put very in place specific. Say, you can't do this and expect a holding call. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's judgment calls like interference and even holding in some instances. But on that portion of holding, they that actually took judgment. the time yeah. to spell that explicitly out, which, as DMAC mentioned, they very rarely do in that book. So it's yeah. that's one of the ones where it's like, you're the guy that does this for a living. You should probably know what you can and can't do to get penalties from the other team, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, so safe to say uh, the excuses are, are really out in full effect versus the Chiefs. Um, we, as I mean, we've said. It, it does yeah. sound like there's something very soft in Vegas out there. 
there is something know, that is very soft uh, in that area. Yeah, it seems like it. Um, also, turns out there's some guy got some somebody got attacked by a coyote. Do you guys see that? I'm sorry, what an NFL player Bad. in at Lake Lock Days who got attacked by a coyote? That's a report. I, like, I saw. I didn't know. I don't know who it was. I saw the. I don't. It's. Yeah, our buddy Charles Goldman made me aware of it. Um, it was a lots local of Vegas happening reporter. today. Yeah. It's a I, Super Bowl in Vegas. We should have now. expected this. We should have seen yeah, this coming. Say, this when like, we decided this is, that there's fair. going to be a Super Bowl in Vegas, this all foolishness has started. You got to expect some craziness. Yeah, you got to expect yeah, there's not, these. Not the, not, yeah, that's not, that was not on my bingo card, though. No, <laughs> I, it really it really was not. The, so there's been a lot of talk um, about distractions already in this Super Bowl as well from a multitude of things. Um, I'm sure we'll get into more of it. Actually, I hope we don't actually have to get into any more of it again, more than we do right now, which is mm. that the incident that happened with Mahomes' dad, Mahomes addressed it this evening when asked about it. It's a family matter, and it's going to stay that way. Okay, good. Moving on. Good talk. Glad we had it. Can we all do that now? Yeah, go back to Jeremiah, the kid. It, it, get it him back be on the asked mic. the rest of the, the week now. I think that's asked and answered, and we can all, you know, go I'm sure. And that's what I'm sure it will. Yeah. Hey, no one, and I'm sure no in the media, I'm sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Not well, try to use that as a way to humiliate a guy who, for all intents and purposes, you know, Pat, Patrick Mahomes, the second, right, has been outstanding and, you know, nothing but a good and example for people. Today. Yeah. And, and trying to, to hold some weird accountable. Like, and, 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 you know, I, I, it's frustrating because it's like, we one we don't know the relationships there you know and we don't know those individuals but i just think like man could you imagine if people try to judge you by some of the things your parents or some of your relatives did hmm, that's what i'm gonna get your everyday person ever. probably yeah. wouldn't like that the sins probably of wouldn't our be fathers. super great don't, don't right? judge us by the sins of our fathers is like one of the oldest lines in, on earth yeah <laughs> like what <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, yeah. it's a, it's a guy that's kind of gone above and beyond what I would say in normal because I've always been kind of a you're not supposed to worth of worship athletes in a certain respect type of person, but he's gone above and beyond to do great things in the community um, on a multitude of levels, uh, and yeah. so uh, for how much uh, crap gets thrown his way because of the peripheral things and things that he's just, you know and people that he's uh, familiar you know, has family ties to, it's unfortunate. Uh, but that is kind of the the piece that comes with being who he is in this position and as great at his job as he is. Yeah, yeah. well said, well said. Um, distractions off the field, obviously, are always a big thing, though. This team uh, does a very good job, I think, of, of really eliminating those outside distractions. Uh, Andy Reid, obviously, is one of the best coaches uh, in the league and reason why is because he can get his guys to, uh, to really focus on the task at hand, which is uh, a fourth Super Bowl in five years, which is once again, very crazy to say. Um, but here we are. And uh, the Chiefs are entering this week of practice. They actually I saw they had a, a padded practice, a full pads day, which was pretty funny. Mm -hmm. So the one team love, no, I love to hear ground. it though. Yeah, one team is playing, yeah. complaining about the, the turf and the other team is full pads. So mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you yes. know, a way to limit distra distraction is go out there and hit somebody. That'll hit make sure you're yeah. wandering. That's, how you, that's <laughs> how you gotta do it. Anyway. Yeah. And the we'll distraction be, we'll stuff. At that point. The distraction stuff. Once you once you put the pads on, like you guys mentioned, the distractions go away. So as Dmax said, I like that they went ahead and just put pads on. I, I this whole week is all distraction. That's why they did all the game plan and stuff last week. Mm -hmm. And this is just stay fresh, stay in it. This is why they have a routine but also it's so nice to have a routine for this game as an yeah, organization Patrick Holmes is actually, as he's actually quoted saying that he has a uh, he has a Super Bowl routine now that he sticks to um, That's, yeah uh, been I mean, here enough time. in the in the in the litany of times we have said didn't think I'd say that as a Chiefs fan in my lifetime <laughs> yeah uh, there's Super Bowls are now Bowl a routine, routine. <laughs> yep. you know not many people I think have ever been able to say that so. He has a pregame routine for the game that most guys aren't supposed to get to. Um, it, yeah, some guys never even play it. No. <laughs> to, most guys. In, in the, I believe one of the things that I, I did see from Media Night was Chris Jones was basically asked about why everybody doesn't like the Chiefs now or something along those lines. And he's like, I don't know. Everybody, we used to, they used to love us, and now everybody hates us. <laughs> and 
he's like, we've all people think we've won. I think more than we have. We've only won two. And, my, and uh, Michael Robbins, I believe, was the guy standing next to him. I only got one. And Chris is like, well, you got more work to do. You you can come hang out with us. We'll try and take you to one if you want. Like, so <laughs> they they get it. Um, yeah. I think the villain quote from Mahomes, which it was one of my favorite quotes to come out from today. Jeff Darlington put it out. It's a pretty long answer um when asked about his villain mm-hmm. was but he he's basically like yeah i i i'm good with it if they want me to be the villain i'll definitely be the villain um yeah. so i i don't know for, i know where i've we've been at a bunch on this but are, are you are you as ready to embrace the villain era as as we are over here because i've i'm ready for this team to just go ahead and be full full villain arc finish this up and then let everybody just start yelling thanks i love it i i'm i'm all in if you if your price of winning this much is to be the villain then so be it bring it on i mean everybody yeah everybody that's ever rooted for a sports you know team is um especially one in which you've started out in the places that we've started out <laughs> where there's playoff heartbreak or terrible seasons and, and awful quarterback play but for it to get to this point where now we're looked at as a league-wide villain, uh, not for anything stupid, but because we simply win too much. Um, yeah. it's, it's a great place to be. I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's we the ultimate kind of respect, really. 1983. We hadn't had our own QB that we took in a normal round that quarterbacks are taken, which is one or two, since 1983. Like, well, I, But that's okay. We had, we had Brody Croyle. And he had oh, arm I, on that kid. If he I watched, the game. Up, I watched Clark Hunt be the nicest, kindest human to Chase Daniel on national television when he told him that we had a lot of good seasons with Chase there and that we missed him in Chiefs Kingdom on this roster. That was the nicest, white, big old <laughs> lie I've ever heard in my life. And I know Mizzou fans won't like that, but no, we don't miss Chase. Those I'm a Mizzou fan, and that is 100% awful. correct. <laughs> no. No. Hey, nope. he was an ex- no, hold on now. He was an excellent backup. I don't know what you're that, talking about. That's awesome. He was the best business backup in the league that I think I've seen. Because that made like $90 million, million yeah, to never hustle. throw he, he was He was a keep getting them checks Hall of Famer, no doubt that about it. That is – <laughs> and I don't fault that man for his hustle on that side at all. But we do not miss you on this roster at all. Oh, not even a little bit. I don't know. Did, have you seen Wayne Gabbert throw a football? Nope, and I don't want to, frankly. <laughs> I hope we don't. I hope we don't. Yeah. I hope we don't. I miss don't Chad Henning, if anything. We need yeah. Chad. Back. Yeah, really. Anything hey, is possible. Darren, back I, back. I, will also, I will also say one of my favorite quotes uh, just in sports world is Reggie Jackson. They don't boo nobody. So, you know, they, they uh, yeah. all the booing that we've heard, you know, tonight going oh, yeah. on. Throughout Travis the Kelsey experienced media. it. I love it very severely yeah. at media day tonight uh he got on the mic on top of the stage and the entire stadium erupted in booze and it fired him up i mean you know it really is like all the all the disrespect and the hate and and everything for the chiefs it's it's really a sign of respect like you say because we just win so much yeah. i mean it's it's definitely a little bit different than the patriots were because they kind of had that underlying thing of like the cheating and uh you know all the different gates that they had and whatnot um, and that fan base and that place. That being fan base. I mean, yeah, you know, they, the they get they're known for doing in their yeah. time in history. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now the Chiefs, you know, it's definitely kind of more just like NFL is rigged type deal for the Chiefs nowadays <laughs> with, with Taylor Swift and stuff. But hey, if they're going to rig it. Well, that, that's, for, that, yeah, that's if they're going to rig the NFL. You know, Boston, for, Boston had to uh, actually cheat their way to their. their yeah, exactly. And stuff. We have it to have real. everybody else think that we're cheating because we're so good. And that's exactly. Like, yeah, they, that's yeah. Yeah. It's real, I real think, cheating versus fake cheating. It's I think my yeah. favorite thing is that they're rigging it for a team with a fan base and a market in the middle of the yes. country that's one of the smallest ones in the league. Yeah, like, that makes yeah. sense. That makes what? sense. Do you guys, yeah. the, the Do you guys think that they would want the the Giants to have a hundred losses in the last <laughs> decade if they could uh, rig it? Do you think they want the yeah. Jets to not have a title since 1960 if they could rig it? You think you would have to go on 30 years for the go Cowboys on, not to be in a, an NFC Championship yeah. game Come on. if they, they could rig these random games? Random team in the Midwest just rewrite uh, everything. Yeah, that's yeah. I don't know about that one, but. And then hey, they, no, they, and then get they pull out the numbers. Ball. They pull out the numbers of the pen. They pull out the penalty conversation and some of the other stuff that we can actually like, you know, see. Measure. You can track. <laughs> and track. It's like, yeah. but no. Well, what about in the last five minutes? Actually, they get one of the worst whistles in that segment. Also, like, no, you're literally yeah. your case keeps getting worse every time you talk. But 
here we go. So <laughs> yeah, it's we're definitely in a good stage where it's like we actually have like a lot of ammo to go back at. It's like, hey, well, this is like everything you have to say is actually just not true. Like, I'm so, sorry. Like, we're how also not making t-shirts. We, we ourselves go, hey, wow, the officiating is really bad on both sides. Like, yeah, it's you know. It's not an advantage if it if it you know screws everybody. Like it's the same. It's that's called an even playing field. It's kind of like, kind of like remember when you know the the field was sloppy last year in the Super Bowl. And it's right. like it's not an excuse because both teams are on the same field. Did they Pretty go out there and like yeah. dry the field out before the Chiefs came out? Like what? I don't understand it. What's the what's the point? Yeah, so it's you like Chris you know, Jones had zero stuff. sacks and, and Hassan Reddick had zero sacks. Like it only affected Hassan Reddick. No, it affects Crazy. everybody. Like it's the same yeah. thing. Like, you think the offensive it, linemen mean, like the field like that? That makes their job ten yeah, times exactly. tougher too. And they they still held it to zero yeah, sacks. Especially so when they, they get up on put on skates when that field's slick and they're sliding. Like yeah, we we Pacheco can do it all day. Get off and it's, take some three steps to get some traction. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's so much fun though to go be able to do this stuff now. But now now it's like legacy conversation time for a lot of these mm -hmm. a lot of these guys yeah. like big time legacy convo so i think for me that's kind of where i want to talk about some of the stuff tonight with you a lot is the main three have or i should say four have a lot lot necessarily riding on this game that probably the rest of these guys don't feel as far as pressure and nobody else really feels as pressure in the fan base anyway but your big core four here have have some legacy on the line here if they want if they really want to take a next step in that that conversation. Uh, Andy, Andy Andy gets this one. Mm -hmm. And and Bill doesn't have a job for next year. <laughs> and yeah. That's that Andy didn't have was it wasn't unemployed for 4 seconds before people were beating down his door to get him hired and and I yeah. and maybe yeah, Bill just said perception. no. Maybe Bill said no. I don't know. I don't know. But I know but that he's Andy not Reed coaching took, this year, and Andy was unemployed for less than an hour. Like, yeah, and Andy Reid took two different franchises to championship games. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. took two different teams to being from nothing to the top tier, top team in their to, in their conference. So they would both you know? have back to back. Was, was rough. They would both have Andy back to back. Also, yeah, like Bill he, and Andy Reid has definitely. A, I mean, you know, I think that will definitely be a conversation unlocked if uh, if Reed gets another another ring here. Um, you know, Belichick obviously has will yeah. always have the advantage of rings, but just overall, uh, you know, coaching Maybe. benefit. You know, I think I think there's going to be a conversation. I think well, there's going to be a conversation. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, he becomes you know if he does rings. if he does win this one, he'll be the fifth coach all time with three rings or, or, or more as far as Super Bowls are concerned. I mean, as far as the, the win percentage is concerned, I mean, he's, he's close as far as comparing him specifically to Bill. So all of those things, you start climbing the ranks and Andy Reid um, is already known as one of the best offensive coaches of all time. But you're talking about back to back Super Bowls, being able to be cemented yourself as a true dynasty. Um, you're entering a lot of rarefied air from that standpoint, certainly. Um, and as you know, we talk about the entirety team, but obviously starting with the head coach, the head coach's job is to win games first and foremost. And you're talking about all time dynasties. This is a team that already has secured the fact that they have the most wins in a five year stretch um, point blank period. They have the most playoff wins in a five year straight point blank period. And if you're able to submit that as far as the dynastic run is concerned as a head coach, as a help of feather to be in your cap. Yeah, no kidding. That's yeah, that's about as good as you can get as far as his coaching abilities though, go. So good to see that uh, he's getting a lot more respect, I think, in the overall uh, media narrative as far as all-time coaches. You know, it's uh, he definitely went under the radar uh, for a very long time. And every year, it's always, you know, the, the coach of the year thing, um, always kind of one of those things that's like, eh, it's the, the new coach of the year. You know, it's, it's the person because otherwise we kind of know who the coach of the year would be. It's the guy who takes his team to the championship game every year. You know, I mean, that is the ultimate definition of a great coach. So, it'll be yeah, I mean, there was always the, the last few years. I think that everybody's kind of had the Bill Belichick in the rings kind of sitting out there. But I mean. I've always just felt this way for the last few years. The best coach in football has been Andy Reid. Like he's, the way that he prepares his team to start out every single year, starting in training camp, even all off season training. The way he's been able to go through different iterations of the team, bring young guys along on both sides of the ball, and obviously a lot of that credit does need to go to Steve Spagnuolo, who we can talk about his legacy as well. 
But mm. the way in which he's able to keep up with the times from an offensive standpoint and, and what he's been able to do with this dynastic run, I mean, I, I, I think that conversation should have been had a long time ago because it's it's yeah. not simply just what he's done with Mahomes. We've seen him do it with lesser quarterbacks, and we've seen Bill Belichick not necessarily be able to do it with lesser quarterbacks as well, um, all things considered. And yeah. then we yeah. watch those lesser well, quarterbacks go to other coaches and be horrible for gigantic <laughs> contracts that they eventually <laughs> did not get. Like, so that factors in yeah. too is like, hey, he was really good, so good that he got paid, and then he left, and then nobody could do it again. Yeah, well, it's not just you know they talk about Andy as the offensive mind, and of course he's you know one of the best of all time to do it, but it's <clears throat> his ability to adapt. It's his ability to, like D-Mac said, you stay current. Like he's been in the NFL a long time. The, the league has changed a ton, right? I mean, he started out with Brett Favre, and you go watch some of those clips and watch how people got hit, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, a little bit different. Um, but also from, like, I, Kyle, kind of what you said, like the quarterback piece, yes, but also the legacy that Andy Reid has a, as a coaching tree, um, which I understand some people, oh, well, that's actually the Bill Watt. Andy Reid specifically has so many guys underneath him that have shaped the last two, three decades of, of it, probably two decades of it, you know, like just his influence is all over this league. Um, the, the fingerprints are, are all over, and it's really hard to hold. I mean, that's. Oh, froze. Oh, he actually frozen froze, not just oh, yeah, got froze. frozen in his pot. <laughs> uh, oh, there I am. It's that it's that time for that uh that annual card. But yep. you hold it next to hold it next to Bill and the, the has he had a single yes. assistant coach be successful in the uh, it's kind of it's a depth yeah, it's, right? Bill's coaching tree is not very large for sure. It used not to be if you were a good coach, coach, right? Like I mean and, and I think Matt Nagy kinda burned some people a little bit, but Andy Reid, it was like every offseason, people were getting poached from the chief staff, right? Doug Peterson, yeah. Matt Nagy, um, you know, and we know Eric Bieniemy went around forever. We know Sean McDermott was on his staff. We know Ron Rivera was on his staff in, in Philadelphia. Oh, like these guys, you know, uh, uh, Harbaugh. Every, yeah. Just, uh, Harbaugh, yeah. You know, Ken, they you want to factor Ken, in. Ken Dorsey, right? Who they just hired. Ken Dorsey? Ken, quarterback coach. Ken Dorsey Cap, was on. Uh, if he wasn't on that. Cap, Cap, for the Giants, yeah. Cap, for the Cap, Giants, uh, yeah. And, um, God, who was the other quarterback coach? That somebody I mean, else he had like stole. Brad Childress back in the day, you like, know. And yeah, Brad, Brad, Brad yeah. Childress. Yeah. yeah, that guy. He was on and on. A coach yeah. for a yeah. I mean, there's and a you, lot you of talk people. about kind of Matt Nagy being the the bad apple of the bunch. He, all things considered, he still got the Bears to the playoffs. So <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, for as bad yeah. as yeah. that team, Mitch you know, Trubisky, quarterback, right? Which... Mr. Trubisky, you know, with all things considered, um, and, and we saw the Mr. Trubisky experience this year. We. Did that like what we saw? That's why Mason yeah. Rudolph finished the year for the Steelers. Yeah, so, no the, you know, even the worst thing. Uh, Mike Tomlin was like, being pretty damn nope, not going down with that ship. Nope, yeah. out of here. <laughs> well, as far as the rest of the uh, the big four, obviously, of in that conversation of the team, obviously Patrick, Kelsey, and uh, I'm assuming you mean Chris Jones on the on the other side of the ball. Yeah, that's part of the big four. Yeah, um, three other guys Mahomes who, has uh, who have a chance to get a third this. ring here. And uh, further cement their legacy. Um, it's gonna be pretty crazy. It's gonna be pretty crazy in, in six days that Patrick Mahomes has three Super Bowl ranks. It's gonna be it's gonna be crazy. He's... Well, I think that obviously, I was gonna say, I, I think that obviously the Mahomes conversation is going to be talked about as it should be because it's quarterback and rings and things of that nature. Travis Kelsey breaking Jerry Rice's records, things of that nature. Those are all should be talked about to an incredible extent. But I think Chris Jones might be the most fascinating character from a legacy standpoint as far as this game is concerned. Um, first and foremost, from X and O's perspective, I think he has the most lopsided mismatch, um, even compared to just those three. Like Mahomes is always going to be able to take advantage of defenses. Travis Kelsey, there's nobody that's going to guard him one-on-one. -on -one. But the interior of that 49ers offensive line is not good. It's really bad. Like people talk about what holding is going to be called. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going to be the right. second quarter, and they're going to be trying to put four hands on him every single down with a chip <laughs> up. I promise you that's going to happen. So he, he, Chris Jones is fascinating from that standpoint. But for the season to have started the way it did with him having the contract dispute, 
holding out, him sitting in the stands, you know, flanked by uh, the Sopranos character, number one <laughs> and number two. And for that to be the start of this and then for everything to be fast forward and him, you know, chasing sacks as far as the Chargers game is concerned at the end of the season and still being in this moment where he single handedly still is the leader of this defense and the driving force of it uh, from an interior pass rush perspective. And there were times in which the Josh Allen and um, and the Lamar Jackson matchups limited what he could do because he was rushing within the team's plan to make sure that those guys didn't get out of the pocket. Brock Purdy is mobile, but he's not those guys. And now he has a chance yeah. to truly make that biggest impact that he really um, can excel at an extremely high level. So it, I think that he might be the most fascinating guy from a legacy perspective to watch in this game because there's a, a reality in which he stamps um, not just, you know, being a, a Chiefs Ring of Honor guy in the future, which I think mm -hmm. that he certainly undoubtedly should be, mm -hmm. but even possibly making all the fame case um, from the all pros that he already has. And another performance here uh, that really stamps himself uh, and as far as memory is concerned because you got to show up on the biggest stage and if you're able to that's the kind of performance that puts you in the in the hall of fame ultimately in can so i think he might be the most interesting guy from a legacy perspective yes yeah, it's, it's, it's a it's a very fun mismatch uh, obviously like you mentioned uh, you know you think about last year the AFC championship game when you when you go against joe burrow and he had an absolutely monster game uh, you know, similar similar vibe. I feel like with uh, with Brock Purdy, definitely not as mobile as uh, Lamar, Josh, or even Jalen Hurts were. So, definitely would be huge to see him uh, to stamp that legacy card and and really ascend to the next level um, with his team. It's, I it, he's definitely the most interesting. I think from that from that perspective, he's the third ring, and him having a let's call it a Frank Clark playoff performance or a him against as, as uh, Garrett mentioned him against Joe Burrow last year performance that those, all those accolades tacked on to what he's already done. I, I think with his influence and he may go somewhere else at the end of this year. He may not, we still don't have an answer to that question, but that all said three rings and, and that influence. And if he keeps remotely putting up numbers for another year or two, I think he's, pretty locked into a Canton case. Yeah. And I mean, and legacy wise, I think one that's kind of underrated and we mentioned it like, and they don't put it in a, they don't put assistant coaches in the, the hall of fame, uh -huh. um, which, you know, but like this would be what Spags is fifth ring as a defensive coordinator, including, you know, two of Isn't those five? being Tom Brady. Yeah. yeah. This would be five, uh, two yeah. with the giants, three with us. So yeah, mm -hmm. including uh, two clamp jobs of Tom Brady. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Which like, that first one, especially. I mean, whew. he um, found a way to hold Randy Moss and Tom Brady to under twenty points. <laughs> which yeah, they, I don't know how. <laughs> I, that game will forever be a mystery to me. I I remember sitting there watching that game, going, "This makes no functional sense." There's no there, no what, sense. how because if you watch that team you just felt like okay this is inevitable like it's you know storybook and then you know you would talk about the nfl being rigged that felt rigged <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> just, not, we were all just helpless that year and then the giants were just an come absolute in like that buzzsaw and then they ran into eli manning and steve spagnolo and that was apparently kryptonite for super yeah that like, was the that was the combo that did it so it's all needed. It's all you need. In to the point Tom makes, I was going to mention this earlier with the T-shirts. The Patriots T-shirts were always some spite thingy. Ours are defensive coordinator love, and amongst it, like, yeah, it, it's a different vibe a little bit. As we were talking mm -hmm. about earlier, um, it's a lot of fun, but it's definitely a different vibe. But the the villain arc is still there. The the legacy that I think I know I mentioned the four. There's one other guy who we never give credit to and talk about because that would require people to actually give this dude credit for anything. It's Brett Veach. They win this one. First of all, four and five years is Looney Tunes and six straight AFC title games is Looney Tunes as a GM anyway. Mm -hmm. To do that in back-to-back -back years when one year, basically everybody thought it was a rebuild slash reload year because you had a bunch of kids. That was last year. This year, they have a quarterback that's going to make the most percentage, I think, of the salary cap ever. 
And if yeah. they win it this year with that, with this, with a roster he put together, you can't not discuss. Like he has to be in conversations, and that's you know, assistant coaches aren't exactly all the time put in the Hall of Fame. Uh, GMs don't traditionally all the time make Hall of Fames either. Um, but mm-hmm. keep doing stuff but like this do. with the best quarterback on the planet, and that's how you get in. And if they win this one, it it puts him in the conversation, I think. Yeah, I mean that, oh, that's yeah. the way that I mean, you get in as a GM. It's it's you have to yeah. have a dynastic type of run. And I think the uh, I've been somebody that's talked about Beach and you know defended Beach at a lot of turns even prior to last year's Super Bowl <laughs> win. It's just uh, the number one thing that's impressive to me is when you look at some of the other dynasties um, that we've seen in, in NFL history. Um, for as amazing as you know the, the Steelers uh, with Terry Bradshaw that defense was the steel curtain that was kind of always the thing that was set in, in place as far as that was concerned 49ers it was Montana to Rice's that was the headliner and obviously they had great defensive players but it was always led by that offense for the ways in which this team has gone under transformation um, specifically in the salary cap era obviously with everything that comes with it that forces you to go under go under change on a consistent basis have a lot of roster turnover for him to have changed his team so quickly according to what the league can't be prepared for um, and what the coaches specifically can take advantage of is amazing to me. I, I think that we, we've we obviously talked about the, the ability to transfer that offensive line, the ability to go from Patrick Mahomes making nothing to all of a sudden making a lot and still be able to field a, a competent defense and then understanding that they needed to get better than just competent on defense and getting mm-hmm. young and being willing to sacrifice that that major piece of Tyree Kill and understanding that you can get it done from a wide receiver perspective because of what Mahomes and Andy Reid can do and Travis Kelsey and being able to still, you know, influence that much young talent into this roster, win in title last year, and then make the proper moves to still come back this year. And obviously there's been a lot of criticism from a wide receiver perspective. All of those bets have not worked out. But the reality of the situation is this is a championship roster that he still put together, um, led by a defense that is currently on a historical run as far as the playoffs are concerned. And so um, yeah, yeah. when you talk about the Patriots of the early 2000s, when they went back to back and won, you know, the Super Bowls that they did in short order, they had to win with defense first. The offense was still secondary, even though that they had their moments on offense. They didn't undergo as much change as this team has in this short order. And I think that's mm-hmm. a big testament to Brett Beach and something that um, doesn't get talked about enough. Yeah, this defense, uh, you know, and and the the theme of the Chiefs, obviously, the past couple Super Bowls have been the offense mostly. Um, Last year, it was kind of defensive heavy, but this year, it's really been the defense taking over and and carrying them through uh, the playoffs and getting them to this point, Um, which is obviously, like I said, a big testament to Brett Feach and everything he's done. Steve Spagnuolo, um, all the work that the entire defensive staff has been doing. It's really impressive to see this this unit come together and – it's gonna be a it's gonna be a fun matchup, I think, in the Super Bowl on the field. Um, you know, obviously the the past two quarterbacks we've had to face, Lamar and, and Josh Allen, very good, very talented quarterbacks. Maybe probably better than Brock Purdy. I'm not you know, that's maybe a discussion you, you to stop, be had. Stop trying to be so freaking nice. Just say yeah. what actually Yeah, I guess you know, yes. according Both to some people, Brock Purdy is the best quarterback in the Brock NFL Purdy. and maybe of all time actually already. So who knows? Who knows? We're gonna find out. Uh, Greatest thing ever. I know from at least my perspective, you know, I I, I said this after the uh, the Bills game that I thought that the Ravens were uh, a less uh, tough opponent as far as uh, the defensive matchup over there to the offense than the than the Bills were, and it sure does feel like the 49ers are even less of a of a task than than those two teams provide. Um, so it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun. I think it's gonna be a fun night from. Uh, from Steve Spagnuolo, who is going for his fourth Super Bowl ring, to clarify. He only has three Super Bowl rings. He was coaching the Rams in 2011 when Giants did it again. Oh, I Fun forgot. Are we sure? Yep. I could have sworn he already Yeah, he was the Rams head coach. He was the Rams head coach at that point. Wow. I, I know he was. Yeah. Coach, but I, I thought he had a second ring prior to the Chiefs already. Nope, only 2008 the Giants did it. And then, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. he got hired in. 2010 wow. or something. Wow, exposed me as fake news live on the broadcast. Regardless, still yeah. edit that yeah. last piece out. <laughs> All right, we circled back. You know, I, I wanted, I, I saw, I was like, I'm pretty sure he only had three, but you guys were so confident. I was saying. A, lo- a little editorial games. there, just to make sure. <laughs> yeah, this would be his fourth yeah, ring. Yeah, to stick it to us. Yeah, he, I, yeah, he will be getting his fourth ring, though. I mean, it's well, basically, you can already set it in stone. Sure. Cause, I, yeah, like the, I like the transition, though, for this, because I think Garrett touches on a point, and 
um, to bring up something DMAC mentioned, the ability to win different ways from Brett Veach's standpoint transfers over to Andy and Spags both. And I think this year's conversation, I've been talking about it for a long time, and it transitions back to his win against the Patriots. He wants that Amoeba NASCAR tr- interchangeable defense. And, and I wonder if you've seen as much of it as I have this year with that also, but to pair that in with the way that they've now adapted back-to-back games against the Ravens and the Bills, defensive players have said they've flat out done stuff at halftime or on the sideline and changed to schemes that they did not even practice that week. And that's Mm -hmm. more back to that adaptability, more back to that amoeba. So the whole theme of this, this franchise, this team, everybody involved seems to almost be that, that mesh and ability to, make whatever work in whichever way they have to turn. And that, that's yeah. a sign of excellent coaching from my perspective. Um, and, and it's, it's mm-hmm. not simply just your big guys. It has to be from a positional to positional basis because these guys have to be versatile and flexible enough to go into those different positions and, and excel in that aspect. And this is something that I've talked about, you know, over the last two years, the addition of Joe Cullen to work with these linebackers and the defensive line at the same time to be able to present more of those odd fronts. That's something that he has in his defensive background that he can bring to Spags and kind of be able to mold together with what Spags already does from a great aspect of being able to dominate in the trenches. So the combination of both of those things coming together, I think you've really seen solidify like you talk about and what we've seen those last two game plans because there's no way for you to line up four guys and rush Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson and have success. You can't do it. They will destroy you doing that on a consistent basis. As a result, you have to get, you know, athletic guys on the field and also be able to guys that are going to be physical at the point of attack to, you know, be able to discourage the run. And you saw that everybody talked about, oh, the Ravens kind of abandoned the run. Part of that obviously is offensive pressure put on, but a part of that is also they were presenting a lot of heavy fronts that you're not necessarily going to have a lot of fun running into being able to throw out Leo Chanel and this linebacker crew in general, obviously drew tranquil had a great game, Nick Bolton, Willie Gay, unfortunately has missed the last two games, but even so we've seen some guys fill in admirably being able to have that versatility to go even to odd fronts based on what you want to present as far as a gap scheme is concerned. It's been incredibly impressive to watch that um, both of those things kind of meld together mm-hmm. and see how they can attack offenses. And, and ultimately speaking, for as many years as we talked about the game plan advantage that the Patriots would always feel like they had um, in a big game, that's exactly what now you have on both sides of the ball because Spagnuolo and Reed are so amazing as far as their head coaching, or I should say their heads of the coaching staffs on each side of the ball, but also because of the ways in which the talent has now meshed to what the coaching staff can really get to whatever they want to. And there's a reason why this team had the most diversity of coverages throughout the entirety of the regular season because now all of those secondary players last year that were still learning the playbook in the playoffs have now a full year of experience in it and now can oh, yeah. play all of those coverages that Spagnola wants to get to on the back end so now we can do the merry-go-round we're starting at two high then going to one high and two is like oh yep. my god I don't know what I'm looking at by the time the yeah it's like what so, is going on playing your, playing <laughs> your exactly. starting safety as your middle linebacker and yeah. throwing your linebacker out in the flat exactly. in, a, in a corner, yeah. corner back slash flat coverage Sending position. Drew Tranquil out yeah. and to play too high safety because he yeah. just yeah. can. And, you know, it's just, just the he fun just can. I mean, they weren't playing that way because like, yeah. like I said, yeah. they drop – and I talked about it a little bit on one of the shows. They dropped Justin Reed into the middle linebacker position and put Nick Bolton on the edge on like a – on like yeah. a, not like yeah. on the edge, like on the end of the line, like – on the edge, like as a corner, essentially. And, I yeah. like, and I'm sure both the quarterback looked at that just like I did and went, what the f- – what are they doing? <laughs> Why? What the hell is going on here? The versatility is crazy. And we've talked about it on this podcast forever. Like, as soon as Steve Spagnuolo gets his set of guys and a, a really confident group of guys that like, he can just move everywhere, like, that's – yeah, that's when you really know it's it's a wrap. Like, he's – fully in his bag of tricks, unleashing every single thing he possibly can, getting as creative as creative as he wants with it. And he just has the guys to deliver. You know, he even said it in a press conference. Like, this is the most this is the biggest group of guys that's just like crazy high football IQ. Yeah. Yeah. Like exactly. you, normally you have a couple of those on every defense. And um this one it seems like Pretty much all of them. Pretty much all of them just have a very in-depth and and really good understanding of the defense and more importantly of what offenses do. You know, like we've said it, like he, he kind of calls games like an offensive coordinator. And as far as mm-hmm. he, yeah. the way he calls the games, he's 
forcing offenses to to conform to one way to do things you know he doesn't let yeah. them get comfortable he he really kind of controls the game um, with the different coverages and looks and everything that he does and it's just great the creativity the the trust in his guys to be able to do that stuff um it's really it's that's been the the high point of this season and what i think will be uh one of the bigger talking points after the super bowl yeah i mean i think um to clarify two quick points one um if you're an nfl coach or general manager um listening to this podcast i just want you to know that uh Joe Coleman is a bum, and I would never hire him as my defensive coordinator. Don't hire so him. You guys, don't no, worry about it. I, I heard. I heard. Oh, he's don't hire yeah, him. You don't want him. You don't want him. Just leave him in KC, where we can we can handle him. So, um, yeah, don't don't take Joe Coleman from us. But also, uh, it's not just like like Z Mike said. Like it's not just the, the big guys up front. It's there's they are so multiple in their secondary, and it's you don't like he will just blitz it's like he just pulls a number out of a hat and it's like all right sneed you're going this time all right mcduffie now it's you watson all right sure like just who wants to blitz now um we'll send we'll send Jamari connor we'll send you know Dion bush we'll send we'll put tommy townsend in at safety and we'll blitz him like we'll just we'll do we'll do whatever you're not expecting but that that goes to you know yes that's excellent coaching um it's also a lot of faith in his guys right to because you have to be a sound sign. If you're sending extra guys, you have to, you know, that that speeds everything up on the defensive. Like, it's just more pressure. It's very boomer bust. Um, and so it's a lot of, it's a, you have to be very cohesive and you have to know your job and do your job. And, and you know, if you're one of the guys who's not going after the quarterback, you've got to make sure that you're on your, your game because, you know, they're going to move fast and they're going to try to get that ball out. And, um, you know, it takes – very little to to go from all right we're blitzing and everything's going well to oh we blitz too hard but like you don't see that with spags's defense because the players have such a they're they're well disciplined they're well coached and they've got great you know there's great instincts and they just they mesh together so well the chemistry especially in the back half um we've talked about that before with those young guys um really is something special and could be something special for years in kansas city if they can you know keep the the core of those guys together and I, I think that it's, it will. Uh, anyway, yes, I, I think there is a certain aspect that you mentioned specifically about the the defensive play calling being like offense. Ways, and I think it's twofold. It's the first part is Spagnolo being the play caller. He's he's sequencing plays together. He is giving these offensive lines, giving these quarterbacks mm -hmm. specific looks because he knows when he gets to later on in the game, he can take advantage of what they've shown to that point. That's why you go in the second mm -hmm. half adjustments and all of a sudden in the second half, you got three blitzes coming all over the place and Chris Jones is going one-on-one -on -one with your worst offensive lineman because you don't know what you're doing from a protection uh, scheme plan for, uh, standpoint at that point. Mm -hmm. And it, so that sequency of the plays is very much a, a how an offensive, you know, a good offensive coach mm -hmm would go about the the game and being able to dictate it from that standpoint and the second part is understanding what the offensive principles are obviously in the trenches mm -hmm. uh, about whatever the protection scheme is going to be on a consistent basis who to take advantage of uh, accordingly and where they're going to slide and things of that nature where the chip help is going to be and making sure that you're wasting offensive linemen uh we're still only sending three guys but still we have a free runner because we presented the front correctly um or on mm -hmm. the back end the ways in which you still are able to cover yourself accordingly to what you know the offense wants to do. You know when this guy is hot and he feels like he's going to be under pressure pre-snap, he's going to try and hit this slant on the backside. Well, guess what? I'm going to have my linebacker or I'm going to have George call off this sit right there to make sure that he's like, yeah. oh, shit, I can't yeah. go there. I got to figure out another place to go. Yeah. And then that's Just the extra beat that you need to hold it. <laughs> yeah, to, to DMAX point and to kind of wrap all this in a bow, I think the two things is we talked a lot Brett Veach has drafted a lot of leaders and a lot of captains of their team. And a lot of, there was a lot of people felt one way or the other about that. It's a very intelligent mm -hmm. defense. They're all extremely smart. As Tom mentioned, the instincts, they all, they're all thinking on the same wavelength, but none of them are actually thinking. They're just reacting and moving together. Mm -hmm. And it's because they all see as much as we talk about Travis and Patrick seeing the game the same way, they all see the game the same way. That's why this mm -hmm. defense is able to, as DMAC mentioned earlier, to move two to one to two and make everybody go, what, what, for what? Well, because yeah. everybody is confused except us, who knows exactly what we're yeah. doing. Um, mm -hmm. And to finish that with the simulated pressure portion, because Tom was talking about everybody has to be, you know, 
super athletic mm-hmm. and, and trust their trust their positioning. And Dmax talking about making offensive linemen stand around and not do stuff where, and finding the pressure matchups. They do that with a lot of simulated pressure looks. So that which, that's how you end up with on when somebody doesn't get home all the way on the free run that they get. You have Nick Bolton trying to help out and run down the center of the field with a wide receiver. That's that's how that stuff happens sometimes. That's why yeah. you'll occasionally yeah. see George Karloftis sprinting 40 yards down the mm-hmm. field with the running back because he's in <laughs> coverage instead of bringing pressure. But they do all he's the sticking stuff. sticking on him, though. He's sticking on him. Well, that's the other part of it. Is <laughs> he's doing his best. Defense, Bro is hauling. <laughs> their, de- their depth level from the last guy on the defense to the first guy on the defense – Yes, Chris Jones is an alien, but the depth level is so much higher than it ever was before because all of these guys can play. So you're getting big time play out of Shamari Connor, Deion Bush. Uh, we yeah. already mentioned Leo Chanel playing end. He basically just plays E yeah. glass, and we go from there. Like he doesn't really have. It's just hit, <laughs> see, hit things, make things hurt. Yeah. that's what he does. Chaos. Chaos. The whole defense is chaos, and that's the thing that I think is the most fun about this defense and about what we've seen the evolutions be from this year and really gives these guys the legacy stuff from Veach to Chris to Spags to that side Mm -hmm. of the ball because that's their legacy. They've they've overhauled the defense that Chris Jones talked about, I think, um, at the end of the AFC Championship game being absolutely terrible like 28th 29th and now they're the second best defense how is he not assistant coach of the year yeah exactly but as garrett mentioned <laughs> exactly. chief fatigue so well, and think about just how bad it felt after the or i should say not after but during the 13 seconds game of you're sitting there like oh man we lost tyron yeah. All right, oh, so I now we have Dan Sorensen as our best safety. Like you could we're hear. running, you know, Mike or not? Uh, I almost said Mike Hughes and, and DeAndre Baker out there corner, and it's like, oh man, <laughs> man. you could hear it. Somebody you could hear the oxygen leave the stadium. I was in the building for yeah. that game when when mm-hmm. when Tyron went down. Everybody went, oh no, mm-hmm. like you. Right. It was audible, and then mm-hmm. for everything that took place to go on in that game, and then for the progressions from there to where they are now. And for all some of the guys on this defense that have taken some heat, much like some of the guys on that defense did, mm-hmm. they've also stepped up and showed out after talking about it on Twitter. So uh, good, yeah. for, good for Justin. Uh, a yeah. good way to follow yeah. up in the yeah. Chief Safety the footsteps of getting yep. a whole all bunch of stuff said and all then the responding and, and then responding on the field too because that's yeah, a guy that's been nails yeah. this postseason. He absolutely, absolutely nails. Absolutely I gotta say, I think, I think and, and, Justin might be a little bit better at Twitter than Tyron was. He's, he's yeah. <laughs> just no, a little Tyron. Tyron. Sorry, Tyron. Tyron. Tyron was great he's at Twitter. Probably, he's he's totally totally yeah. The, the other thing, though, is the evolution of what it was just in last year's AFC Championship game. One of the least talked about things is the Jerry Sneed goes out of that game that you lose mm. what was your best corner. And even though I, I love Trey McDuffie, I think still at that time, LeJerry Sneed is the best corner on that team. You lose him three snaps into the game versus mm-hmm. the best wide receiver core in football versus mm-hmm. Joe Burrow. And yeah. your defense is so young Huge and defense. still being able to step up to that level. Obviously, Brian Cook going down this year and still having the ability for these guys to, to fill in admirably. I mean, it, obviously, I think one of the most underrated things is this defense hasn't necessarily been able to do as much as they probably would have liked to all year because Dick Bolton and Drew Trank will have been out of the lineup so much as well. And they've had to put in the Jack Cochran to the world and Cam Jones, who still equip themselves fairly well for what they were asked to do at times. Right. And, and so all those things considering, I mean, it's been impressive what they've been able to do on the defense side of the ball, the depth. And like you said, everybody just playing on the same wavelength. And I think, you talk about the leadership and the understanding of the game, but it's also a certain level of selflessness. Um, it, there's um, there's a, a propensity, you know, to go and, and do for a guy like George Kalaftis, who's a first round edge. No, I want to put my hand in the dirt and go rush the pass every time. Well, guess what? I need you to go and drop in the coverage right here. And he's willing to do that. That's because they're yeah. bought into it to that level. And George Kalaftis is the type of football player that takes pride in being able to do those things. Or putting your hands up as a D lineman instead of chasing mm-hmm. a sack when you know mm-hmm. you're not because there's look around this league there's guys all the time that do not get hands up on passes when they know they're not getting home but that's what <laughs> goes back to the Cullen conversation and the Spags conversation see how this stuff all is tied together it it all works in a unison and it's why this organization and this has been so successful and it's been so much fun I 
there's just not a lot else that you can ask for on this run than what they've been doing. Yeah, yeah. defense well, definitely the deserves. Why, sorry, yeah, yeah, go I was ahead. Just saying, on Kyle's note, real quick, there's a reason why a lot of defensive linemen don't like to put their hands up, and that's because your ribs are open. And if you're playing an offensive lineman who, uh, as they as I like to say, he's really gritty, he'll take a little shot and hit you in the ribs. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, that, that shows the dedication to that, right? To go, all right, this guy might punch me in the rib cage, but – if I can bat a pass, that's as good as, you know, that's as good as a sack or whatever else. You know, you're taking away that down. Yeah, exactly. Ends ends the down, ends the – that's good. That's good. The D-line has been Try playing good. The entire board, defense right? definitely deserves their flowers, and rightfully so. But we got to talk about the offense as well, obviously. Still uh, a very exciting unit, a much different unit, obviously, this year, um, winning in their own way. A lot more running the ball, a lot more just kind of controlling the clock, especially like we saw versus the Ravens where – and that's kind of the benefit of having a defense that can absolutely just lock people down uh, for an entire four quarters mm-hmm. is that you can be a little more methodical on offense. It's not as rushed. Um, you can kind of uh, take your time a little bit and control the clock. DMAC, I know obviously uh, this season offensively has been the biggest concern for the Chiefs. As soon as they hit the playoffs, though, it seemed like they started to figure it out once again, which is, you know, just classic Chiefs. They just wait until the playoffs to start playing good again. Um, what do you kind of expect uh, from the, the the team in the Super Bowl, the offense specifically, and you know, based off what we've seen the past couple of weeks from them? Well, look, I, I'll say this first, starting with the past couple of weeks. I think that um, there have been aspects of this offense that hasn't necessarily been the prettiest at times. I mean, you, you can argue, you know, versus the Miami game, they didn't necessarily finish in the red zone, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. Obviously they had the one touchdown called back. Um, you know, some people were concerned about the icing in the end zone. Obviously it's negative 30 degree wind chill. So you can understand why they weren't necessarily being able to, you know, put 40 points on the board from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously oh, in the imaginary. Buffalo game, they moved the ball effectively. Um, they put up a significant amount of points and, and were able to get the job done. Still Buffalo had so many injuries as far as their back seven were, was concerned as well. And the Ravens, I, I think you went up against an excellent defense and and obviously after coming out with those first two drives and still getting the field goal before halftime you did go into a ball control type of thing but that's okay this 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 um this isn't about style points at this current moment in time everybody on that offense understood that the only thing that could really get the ravens back in the game truthfully was them turning the ball over and they were able to take care of the ball at a high level it it led to a bunch of punts it did (laughs) and look that's not necessarily on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, took, he took his – I don't think he took it on purpose. because well, he was I don't trying think he would have preferred it, but once he re- <laughs> he didn't resign himself to it and took it, and traditionally, even when he's resigned himself to a sack, he still tries not to take that sack. So mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he put <laughs> every rare. ounce of Bobby Stroop training into not taking that <laughs> sack and then was like, yeah. oh, man, there's another guy. I'll that training and that thing side by side were crazy. Yeah, man, that just scared me, but uh, I'm glad that was all right but yeah i mean it's just an understanding of what's needed in the moment and, and i think that's led first and foremost by patrick mahomes who has entered a different kind of stratosphere as far as quarterback mastery of the game yeah. starting from you know everybody five years ago latching on to that i i didn't really read defenses you know quote that came out um and then <laughs> where he has gotten to this point where there's no blitz that you're throwing at him that he's not ready for. Like the Ravens got yeah. him once and that's the best defense as far as the opposition is concerned and blitz design is you're ever going to see. Um, and so fast forwarding specifically to the Super Bowl and what the 49ers do, they run a lot of static coverages. That's the way that they do. They don't do a lot of pre-snap design. They like to put their hands in the dirt and come after you from a defensive perspective. Fred Warner is not necessarily the biggest run defense type of guy. And they've had a lot of struggles with the run defense, specifically in the interior. As a result, there are opportunities for this offense to have a very good day, um, especially with two weeks to game plan for, you know, Andy Reid is going to have specific wrinkles for this. Um, And I I truly do believe this offense is in for a good day as long as they continue to take care of the ball. And and that's the number one thing that I said coming into this. If they can possess the ball, not make dumb turnovers, even in the Buffalo game in which they still had one of those. It, it is what it is. You're still able to have a productive day. This defense, specifically for the 49ers, while it does have very good players on it, there's no doubt about it. The scheme, the ways in which they try to dictate to offenses, there are plenty of advantages that the Chiefs can find. Um, and I think it starts with the interior of the offensive line, being able to move guys. This offensive line in general, I think, has played at an excellent level. Uh, Donovan Smith mm-hmm. and Juwan Taylor throughout these playoffs, I mean, 
aside from the occasional penalty, which, you know, it is what it is. You're going to have to live with it. I think they both played at, at an extremely high level. Um, Nick Allegretti equipped himself very well for Joe Tooney, I thought, in the Ravens game as well. Um, Karina and Trey have been mauling guys the entirety of this playoffs. Dogs. And so, Absolute dogs. Yeah. When you feel we, like you uh, already have a... I was, I was did we say ever we, find out if Trey's going to be able to play after he murdered that uh, Ravens defender? <laughs> You can't do that on live TV, man. They're going to show up. They're going to. Mike McDonald yeah. sacrificed that DB. <laughs> he should not uh, have. He sent him from 10 yards back. And Trey's yeah. like, are, are you, you got this, man. You can do it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, now I got to come over here. <laughs> he had to have been lie. piping him up he on the side. looked at him the whole way. Yeah. Trey was like, you're yeah. not. No, you're not. You're, I know you know better than that. Come on. You want me to go, right, well, you want me to go through which gap? The gap? The, the, the you see that sixty-five guy 65? there, right? No, he's away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the DB getting that oh, assignment. Man. Like I have to go sixty-five. You know, Mike McDonald's on the sideline. You got this. You can. Yeah, you got. Yeah, this. you run. You get right you by. Right. You sure I can't go around the edge? Maybe I'll just you know loop around. <laughs> nah, I need you right here. I, I, maybe I get contained, coach. Maybe I just get contained. Like, can I get contained? Yeah. Nope. Oh, right. Right. But right. Yeah. I mean, I think I think the offensive line is probably where it starts because I, I do believe that mm -hmm. the scheme, the ways in which they can get after these guys, um, they can run the ball in the interior and force the 49ers to commit more resources to the run. And I think at that point, um, you trust Patrick Mahomes to kind of open it up a little bit. Um, I, I think that there will be times in which you are going to have to create some explosive plays to Justin Watson, to MPS. I think that's the reality of the situation because they're going to run blitz you the same way that we saw kind of in the middle of part of the season. Teams like the Eagles, after getting run on significantly, they said, all right, we just got to run blitz and hope we take away enough mm -hmm. of the short passes and we're going to dare you to beat you over the top. I would not be surprised if you get to that point in the third quarter as far as the 49ers are concerned. And they have to be prepared for that, and I expect them to be. And I, I think that they will equip themselves well when that is asked of because I, I've got nothing but faith in Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes at this point. So Yeah, and there's no reason not to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they've got an offensive line that isn't, you know, got down 26 starters, and, um, you know, they've been good in those games. I'd also say – I think we're starting to see, and, and I'm sure, you know, there's a level that comes with, like, you prepare the whole season for this game, right? Like, you, you're you going to play. We've seen this team be the best when they're able to kind of, like, loosen up a little bit and just really play, and then Pat's able to – because I think that's – part of it was this year you saw some of the frustrations, and it felt like, you know, regardless of what he said at the podium after games or, like, what was going on in the locker rooms, we never know, but, like, it felt like – Maybe Pat did, you know, was losing the faith in his guys. Like, right? Maybe the, the play looks like that sometimes, right? He was, eh, hesitating to throw, you know, hesitating to, to do this to to that. There was a couple of weeks there in the in the regular season where we're like, what in the world's going on with his offense? Now you're, you know, this is where you leave it all all out in the field. This is where you're kind of like you're just opened up. It's either going to work or it's not, and so you just, you know, you go for it. And you know, that's where I think you go back to last week in the the throw to to MBS. It's like, all right, like. You know, it's either here or it's not. And, you know, yeah. having that faith, I think, historically for this team has paid off more than it hasn't. Uh, it just always hurts a little bit more when it doesn't, <laughs> especially yeah. I mean, those were all regular season moments. And so you can recover from those, you know, but this is this is the time where it's like we got to come full circle and, and you can make up for, you know, a lot of – you can atone for a lot of sins, uh, looking at you, Mr. Tony, uh, by making some plays in this game. Now the he big just, punt return, he's back in he had good some, graces. He had some interesting yeah. thoughts at media night with Michael Robinson. He sure did. Also, I'll let he you sure guys. Did. I'm not. We're not. I'm Very not touching those tonight. I'll let you guys Very look those up if you want to. Um, I'm good. I, I think I, I want to toe tap a couple points. One off of DMAC a little bit, and one off of Tom. Um, from the most recent thing that Tom was just going over, you know, with the variations there, I, I like, I like it, I like it, I do. And I think it feeds into – actually, I guess I want to go D-Max first. It feeds into the – you talked about adjustments with the third down in the third quarter when they're going to try to probably have to run blitz. And we've seen over the last couple of weeks the multiple tight end sets and the use of Pacheco. They ran him 24 times against Miami for 90 yards. They ran him 24 times against the Ravens, that one for 70 yards. They only ran him 15 times against the Bills, but it was a different, a little bit different style game. That number of carries is, is important, I think, and, and getting a Pacheco that workload, especially early when they can take advantage, is a big thing. But I also think that, you know, you mentioned the interior of that offensive line and Nick Allegretti. 
when Brian Baldinger watches it and goes, I didn't really notice a difference between Nick Allegretti and Joe Tooney on the inside. That's a really good thing. Like good a really good a pretty thing. high compliment. <laughs> yeah. So mm-hmm. um, from that perspective and going down that road, it's, it's so important to, to do those things. That, but I think some of the frustrations that this offense went through and maybe this whole team went through is they know where they're supposed to be on the checklist throughout the season and whether they're not there yet or they can't get to where they want to be yet. Some of it is frustration for not being where they think they're supposed to be already. And some of it is frustration of they're ready to be somewhere else at throughout the points Mm -hmm. in the year. We talk about, you know, when you win this much and they're in the playoffs this often, it's really hard as for the regular season to mean the same amount as it does every year (laughs) for these guys. And, especially when you're that you're the guy that stirs the drink. So now he's talking about routines in the Super Bowl. You don't think he has regular <laughs> routine checklists throughout the season of where they expect to be and where he oh, yeah. expects everything. Like, and we talk about that every year. So all of those frustrations, all of that and the meshing point, but yeah, this team's loosened up because now the expectations are off. It was like, yeah. Oh, we got third. Nobody thinks we can do this. Cool. Now we don't have any expectations. Let's go tear people apart like we were all year, yeah. all, all the last couple of years. So yeah. from that perspective, it's so much – this is where I think the villain side comes in. If you just play the villain role the whole time, there are no expectations because everybody hates you. Yeah. 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 You're always the person that needs to be beat. And if you win, it's not exciting for everybody else, you know? It's mm-hmm. just like, oh, look at that. The villain won again. Ooh, you know. <laughs> it's pretty fun. I, the, the point that uh, I like the point that Tom mentioned about the unwavering faith in guys. Um, obviously, it's the Chiefs. They, they really know how to do it. Like it, you know, MBS, like people wanted him cut every single week of the year. They wanted him cut, him cut for last some reason year right before the year. AFC title game. Yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah, except for up here at the Kingdom Says podcast, we have had unwavering support. Say that ever, for... No way. We would yes, have yeah, never said that about our boy MBS. Me and Tom were 100%, no doubt about it. These two are his Pat, biggest Patrick, fan ever. Patrick Mahomes is a, a much better man than me because I swear I would not have thrown anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody has, like, I would not have. Yeah. But that's so why he's like, an all-time great quarterback, and I'm not. Yeah, and Anybody that's else, why, it's incredible. <laughs> and that's that's really why this team is like just so – I mean, we've seen it year in, year out. I mean, it was Dan Sorensen every year on the defensive side, and then every year, without a doubt, he's going to make a big play in the playoffs. You know, he had the, mm-hmm. the Texans game. He had the Browns fumble, like – it, the, yeah. the the commitment to these guys, and that's obviously why they, I think, play so well in the playoffs because they have the unwavering support and, and trust from their teammates and their coaching staff that they're just going to keep doing it. You know, MBS, to his credit, he just kept going at it, it kept showing up and working and, and ended up paying off for him. So. Online, in the locker yeah, room from you, question. You didn't like what the, the quotes were, but that's the reality yeah. of the situation. And this is – this is kind of goes back to Andy Reid's legacy is that, you know, the things that early on in his coaching tenure were looked at as weaknesses of being a little bit too much of a mm-hmm. player coach and, and being too patient with guys. It's, it's not, it's, you know, and now it's a strength. The fact that he's willing yeah. to stick with these guys, even through regular season mistakes. And, and part of that is mm-hmm. obviously the, the luxury of knowing that at the end, you're going to be there in the end, but that you can afford a few of those, but you know, he's like, yeah, and it's MVS. He's going to go out there. He's going to keep running these routes, and we're going to throw the ball to him. And eventually, it's going to work. Okay, it did one so. of these times. <laughs> yeah, and there you yeah, go. They, you know, we'll 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 just make a one-handed catch over over, over uh, Turin Johnson in, in the Buffalo game. Just yeah, you know, we, yeah. We it's going to be it's going to be real fun to see the uh, the offensive game plan for this game. I think because you multiple know, tight ends. We, multiple tight yeah, we'll unload the 12, 12 personnel. Drake Greenlaw's not that make good. Make it happen. <clears throat> yeah. It's going to be um, very fascinating because it, the the one real thing is is obviously Bosa has the ability to direct the game, um, yeah. and, and and versus these tackles is going to be the matchup to watch. Um, but we saw last year um, versus the 49ers, they had a very specific game plan to make Bosa's life a living him. hell. They drove him and, insane, <laughs> and and they did it. They had him spinning. It. They they could not figure. He couldn't figure out what was going on the entirety <laughs> of the game. Um, he just couldn't. He, he didn't know what was happening, and that's that's a tough thing about playing the Andy Reid team. You're going to get all things, all manner of things thrown at you, and it'll be fascinating to see how they handle that matchup. Certainly, but I'm I'm confident in what this offensive line can do specifically because I know that they're going to have that type of game plan in place for Bosa. And the reality of the situation is, guys like you know Hargrave and Chase Young and 
and you know, uh, and, and Eric Armstead, they've kind of underwhelmed this year a little bit uh, compared mm-hmm. to what you've seen from 49ers. Yeah, yeah. Especially, you, especially watching paper. that Lions game. If you watch that Lions yeah. game, there were some snaps from that defense, specifically the D line. You're like, "Eesh, that is the Lions." The Lions and the Lions yeah. have a great offensive line, but they were getting anything they wanted uh, yeah. on a consistent yeah. basis. And Jared Goff was very comfortable in that pocket. Yeah, Nick, no kidding. Nick it's uh, looked another like the, looked like the rush hour skit when he couldn't figure out which one kicked him for <laughs> a, several minutes. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like, okay, we'll Jared McKinnon him. just hit me in my ribs, and then Trey Smith hit right, me in my other ribs. I, Hold on. Wait, wait. Travis, wait, wait. What? He calls on the way me. What is happening? <laughs> what is going on? Yeah, it's. I, I can see that happening. By the way, Jarek McKinnon, uh, a surprise name that ended up probably going to be available yeah, for the Super Bowl. How after, surprised? Uh, do you undergoing mean? core core muscle surgery only a couple weeks ago. Um, I, and I swear there was more to that injury too. Yeah, it seemed like yeah, there was. I mean, I, it seemed like there was a lot I mean, that was going on with that. Broke that my skull a little bit. Very much seemed like it. Uh, <laughs> It would be the end of his season. Turns out he's actually likely going to play in the Super Bowl. Turns out, yeah. Um, yeah I, was, I was a little, I was a little uh, surprised yeah. to, to hear that he was going to be designated to return, but I was certainly happy about it. I, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be a situation where he comes back and plays like half the snaps or anything. But I think there are opportunities to use him very specific packages, which we've always seen as far as the red zone is concerned, or or yeah. pass protection type of downs. And Big pass if he's throw, ready yeah. to do that, yeah, because I mean he has that mind for the game to understand what he needs to do, and Mahomes trusts him from that standpoint. So. If he's ready to come back rolling, I'm certainly going to be happy to have him back in the running back rotation. And obviously, CEH has, you know, made, you know, one to two plays a game as far as from a backup running back perspective. And Pacheco, he makes we some know plays it. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sometimes yeah. that's a one to two. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe but, like um, still and, only give him a couple carries. Yeah. I got crazy right. with this. So and, and I Pacheco do. I did want to clarify. I told you. I told you guys I thought there was more to that injury. Charles. Our, our buddy Charles over at A to Z Sports, Charles Golden, we had him on uh, last week. Um, written by one of his guys over there, Nick Roche. Um, McKinnon has been on injury reserve with a groin injury since late December. He also went underwent surgery for a core muscle and a fractured pelvis. Ooh. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, Jesus. How he's he walking, yeah. let alone active to work. practice. This and potentially going to play is something I hope. To, apparently, that fracture was very small, or I don't. I don't know how that works. Um, I don't know. That's, that's crazy. Fractured though, which but is tough. Also, just a minor I really, fracture. I don't. I don't. I, I mean, it's awesome, and it's no offense to the Michael P. Ryan, but I will absolutely take Jarek McKinnon over the Michael P. Ryan if Jarek McKinnon is eighty-five oh, yeah. percent oh, yeah. healthy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the only consideration there is if you feel that you're covered for special teams. And I think Pete Ryan has had a few snaps as far as special teams is concerned. But, you know, I, I, I don't I don't think that you're too concerned as far as that is, is you know, going on. I think you'll be fine as far as that is concerned. The, the one thing I will say, because we didn't – I know we, we were talking offense, but the, the other interesting character as far as the defense is concerned, because I, like I talked about, there are going to be opportunities for this team to actually brush guys and, and you know, actually try and put pressure on Brock Purdy and, and get him down to the ground. I mean, uh, the the Felix and DK Uzama, you know, uh, draft yep. pick started out as, you know, a nice hometown kid gets his, his first round pick and, and, the draft and, yeah. and everything. And uh, the first few weeks of the season were certainly up and down. And then when, you know, CEO came back and shout out to Charles and Menehue, I, I thought he was going to be an incredibly impact player uh, when we Dollar. signed him. And I, I'm yeah. I, I'm so happy that we got what we got out of him. And I'm hoping that he has a quick recovery from his ACL. I wish he was playing in this game, certainly. But mm-hmm. now that brings FAU back into the focus um, as a guy that's been kind of inactive for the last few weeks. And you hear everything that they've been talking about, that now he's going to be given an opportunity to make some type of impact in this game. Um, he has speed off the edge. Obviously, the matchup with Trent Williams would be an issue. But if you put him over the right tackle, I feel pretty good about what he can do as far as actually giving Brock Purdy some some pressure as far as that's concerned. So for those pass rushing snaps that they're, I think they're going to be able to get to um, throughout this game, I want to see him out there. I want to see what kind of juice he has because I still think the kid is incredibly talented. He just need to, you know, shore up some finer points of the game. And I saw better things from him as far as the Chargers game was concerned. So mm-hmm. I want to see, yeah. you know, in those small sample of snaps, if he can uh, make a play or two and really, you know, ingratiate himself to the Chiefs kingdom. I, he's such yeah. an interesting piece and tr- I'm shout out to Charles for traveling with the team, going out and being a part of Super Bowl week and doing all that. I yeah, believe cool he's with him still regardless. Definitely um, cool. he's, Hopefully he apparently they still have some, well. they still have some ideas or some role for him. I don't know if he's going to be 
rolling around on the sideline being a cheerleader or being crazy or what yeah, what all little, that entails. Uh, little scooter but, out there on the practice field, you know, the I, mobility I scooter guess, with his leg on a cast or something. Yeah. That'd be cool. And then and then shout out to I know everybody likes to do this thing well anymore anyway that the draft picks are boom or bust within 15 minutes of whether or not they're playing as as an elite player in the first 5 seconds anymore. He's he's played okay in the beginning for a guy who'd never been on an NFL field before. Um, there was always going to be an adjustment and there was always going, he was also not supposed to have to play that early because there wasn't supposed mm-hmm. to be guys missing. So like yeah, that's everybody true. that's worried about what he did earlier in this year, that's, a, that's great. That's a problem. He, he probably benefited a heck of a lot from sitting and watching and learning from George and from Mike and from Charles and from Chris and, and getting reps on the side and getting some of that. And also getting a couple of snaps in dead games. And like D-Mac mentioned, the Chargers game. He's, I think he's going to be just fine. Also, I don't mind if you put him over against Trent Williams. Because then you're wasting Trent Williams. No offense to like... If, but if, I was, was going to say that a little bit too. Like, Maybe just have them go up against Trent and let George be on the other side. Go ahead. All, all th- yeah, all things considered, if you're just going to yeah. have FAU run the, the arc all the time, that's fine. Hey, Make oh, Trent Williams yeah. have to... 45 set every single night. time he gets out there. Yeah, about to say, just tire him out for real. Yeah, just that guy make work. him chase him up the yard every single time. I, I'm perfectly fine with that as well. And and that Not leaves you with plan. a chance to where you don't have to. You don't see Chris Jones anywhere near Trent Williams. You don't see George heads up with Trent Williams. You don't none of that. You 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 can dictate much like Spags we talked about, like Dmac talked about earlier. Oh, yeah. Spags can dictate from there what he wants to do. So uh, as much as everybody's been worried about the FAU pick or whatnot. I'm I'm fine with it. I was fine with it when it happened. Got chill out. Yeah, just got chill out and it, let it happen. Well, they've they've hit a lot more than they've missed, and I think we talked about proved that a lot earlier when with our conversations earlier about the draft picks. Even in the wide receiver room, they're like fifty percent hit rate. So everybody relax. It's it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Let these I kids agree. play. I agree. Right. Let she writes is a hit, correct? Like we're not. We're not yep. arguing that at this yeah. point. Yeah, I was trying to think okay. of any other. I was just trying to think of any other hit. <laughs> like anybody in the top three rounds, there's only two receivers one. that have been taken yeah. in the top couple of rounds. So yeah, so I guess that's fifty percent. Rashid and Sky, boom, there you go. <laughs> Nobody was like, oh, I think Cornell Powell is going to be the number one wide receiver on this team in two years. I mean, judging off those pictures from his pro day, I don't know if y'all remember that. Hey, but... dude's a freak. He had a great year at Clemson that one year, his yeah. senior year. But also, that was like... about it though. That was no, about it. Got to have like, a little he faith. He looks like he should. He looks like he should be so much faster than he actually. He is. <laughs> turns Correct. out, yeah, it's yeah. Turns and again, out. Like, but, but that's not a that's not a top three round. That's not a top yeah, ninety yeah. or hundred pick. Yeah. That, that so when you go through those and you go through the rest of what they've done. They've done pretty well. Let's let's give Felix the benefit of the doubt and let him mature and let him develop a little. He may surprise yeah, you guys this year. I agree. I agree. Uh, is there anything else you think we should? Uh, I want to ask Dmac one more question. Okay. Okay. One and more then question. I want. I kind of. And then I'm sure Tom. I want kind of want Tom to answer it too because I know he's got stuff this week. So we may, he may or may yeah. not be around with no, us. No, I. No, I definitely want to be here for Dmac's question. All right, Dmac, who's your f- favorite Kingdom says uh, co-host? <laughs> <laughs> was that, not the I, I, that was not question. the question that was a great question yeah that wasn't that my was question yeah. maybe his question I, I, but, did. Uh, I don't have an answer but i am so jealous of your beard tom like i just i mean yeah I, that's we a, all that are the right we, answer. i mean it's just tom's got the beard and the I, dog I, wish I, I could i could go that that's um, I'm yeah I don't say his name he's sleeping he'll get up and scowl yeah, no, it's, <laughs> we're working on it. don't stop don't don't wake him up he'll climb up in my lap again he's not a skinny dog he eats well um so we talked about El- Legarius and, and Trent earlier. Uh, the Niners are an interesting team um, schematically from an offensive perspective, from how they use Debo Samuel and what they what all they try to do with him. Uh, are you? I've I've gone back and forth on what I think Spags will do this week. I, I legitimately think Legarius is going to travel with Brandon Ayuk, and then they're going to deal with Debo as a unit. Uh, I don't know where is your head on mm-hmm. what you think Spags will how Spags will address the uniqueness of Shanahan's um, usage of those wide receivers and how he uses Debo as more of an everything than just a wide receiver. Yeah. I mean, look, that that's, that's a, a very difficult answer to give because I, I think that it's not necessarily going to be um, a, a set game plan. Now, as far as money downs are concerned, if they're playing man to man, I think it should be Snead on Ayuk because Ayuk is their guy that beats man coverage on a consistent basis. He's the one that Brock Purdy is going to look to in those moments to make big plays um, we, we saw the deflection down the field that, that Ayuk was able to make a play on, but 
when he needs a third down conversion, it's going to be him or it's going to be Kittle. Um, because those are the two guys that generally beat man coverage on, on a more consistent basis. Um, those kind of joker players, as far as CMC is concerned and Debo, that they try and get those linebacker matchups on. It's going to be fascinating to see what their plan is from that perspective. Um, it's kind of a build your defensive game plan from the trenches out and trust that your back seven is going to do what it should do on a consistent basis. I, I think that it starts with being able to put Snead on, on Ayuk first and foremost, like I said, but then everything else is very flexible. If you need extra guys on, on whatever your concepts are, if you need to have a double team on, on Kittle on a certain route that you feel like you, you're going to have to on a money down, I completely understand that. If you feel like Christian McCaffrey is going to need a little bit extra attention on a certain route, I get it. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Watson and Williams have been playing so well as depth corners. I trust them versus Jennings. I trust them versus Debo on a lot of those routes because Debo, while an incredibly versatile piece, is not a guy that's always going to be amazing versus man coverage one on one. So those are those aspects that I think they're going to be most important as far as getting off the field is concerned. On the early downs, it's kind of a let's make sure we're covered as far as the run is concerned not allowing those explosive plays and we'll deal with everything else underneath and move forward from that aspect. So I think that you're on the right track as far as need on IUK. And then after that, it kind of on a case by case basis. And the one thing about SPACs that we talked about, it, everything's going to change up, you know, from what you see. Uh, I think that Brock Purdy has not faced a defense like this. Um, and, and obviously the Ravens for everything that they are incredibly fast, the discipline on the back end, they are physical they didn't have Chris Jones in the middle of that defense. And then on top of everything from a Spags game plan perspective that comes with it, there's a different level of having that alpha level pass rusher that brings to it, which I always talk about when it comes to this time of year, you need that guy that single-handedly can destroy your offensive line. And that's what Chris Jones brings to the table that you have to plan for in your protection schemes. And then you're adding what Spags can do from a blitz perspective and simulated pressure aspects. So to me, if you're going to win on defense, it has to start in the trenches, and that includes early downs in which you have to earn the right to run, watch the passer. But I believe in what this back end has shown on a consistent basis. I believe that they can match up with an elite weapon core that the Niners have as long as you're taking care of your business as far as the trenches are concerned and putting pressure on Brock Purdy. And for all things considered, I think Brock Purdy is a solid quarterback. I don't think he's a game manager because I think he puts the ball in harm's way a little bit too much to be a game manager. But he also gives you some better plays than Jimmy G did. Those game, well, I should say, those uh, ball and harm's way type of aspects, the ones in which the Lions and Packers dropped, those are the ones in which the secondary has to take advantage of because I do believe that they're going to put pressure on them and force them into some of those mistakes, and those are the ones you have to take advantage of. And if you are able to, then you can single-handedly flip the game on its head. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's going to be a big factor, uh, the defense stepping up and really taking control of the game and, and capitalizing on those mistakes that, I think are bound to happen. You know, I mean, you know, Chris McCaffrey's going to get his a couple times and Brock's probably going to get one or two, but uh, knowing this defense and the confidence level that they have in everything that they do, um, I cannot see them uh, squandering many of those opportunities, let's say. So um, should be good. Should be good. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's about, about everything we've got for this episode. Um, DMAC really appreciate you coming on uh, and, and join us for this one. Where can everybody find you and your content and, and everything else that you do? Absolutely. Look, I am at DMAC Wake 316 on Twitter. Um, that's why I have my Red Friday spaces every single uh, Friday afternoon, usually around 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, and then also you can find me on Kingdom Cast. We have our Teletooth podcast with me, CJ, and DG, for those who do not know. It's also on the Kingdom Cast account, but it is the Teletooth podcast. And then also use on the Kingdom Cast uh, crew. We hang out on Thursday nights as well. So uh, that's where you can find me, man. Yeah, if you guys have missed, have missed Tell the really Truth, it's a very good show. They do a whole bunch of in-depth stuff, uh, yeah. breakdown-wise, bring up a bunch of different clips and plays. It's it's a good time. So check them out for sure. Thank you again, DMAC, for coming on and joining us tonight. Yeah, if you want to get Absolutely. smarter and know more about Chiefs football, you definitely got to follow DMAC because he is a good follow and uh, is very well-educated in that stuff. So very fun to have you on tonight, and uh, we'll definitely have you on more in the future, uh, You know, hopefully after we get a, a big Chiefs Super Bowl win here. So. Uh, everybody watching and listening, thank you so much for tuning in and joining us today. Uh, be sure to check us out, Kingdom Says Pod, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Check out our YouTube, Kingdom Says Pod, over there. Uh, you can find us on any podcast platform that you prefer, Apple Music, Spotify, everything else. Um, 
we've got some more content, a lot more content coming for you uh, the rest of the week here. We've got a couple more guests lined up, a lot more uh, talk to be had. Obviously, the Super Bowl week going on, there's going to be a lot more to talk about. Like Kyle mentioned at the beginning of the show, really wish the game was just here already so we can get this <laughs> over with. This is a long this is a long week. Uh, it's been a long time with uh, without Chiefs football. You know, it was weird yesterday without having no no real football. I mean, there's a Pro Bowl, I guess. Pro Bowl is kind of cool, but uh, not seeing the Chiefs on my TV on Sundays is – uh, not a good thing. So can't wait that to see that. So whack. It's kind of whack, but you know, it's, it was better than in previous iterations of it. I, was, I, I think that can be said. I need Sean Taylor killing a punter. I don't need. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh man. I mean, we can all, we can all strive for, for Sean Taylor killing punters in the pro bowl, but mm-hmm. um, we'll have to Brian settle with the uh, right for that. Yeah. We'll have to settle with uh, another, a week long of Super Bowl talk and chatter and, uh, everything else under the sun. So appreciate you joining us, tune in, and we'll see you guys on the next episode of the Kingdom 